The os coxae is a part of the bony pelvis that is made of three bones that fuse during childhood. The ilium is the largest portion and is located superiorly. The pubis is located anterior and medial. And finally, the ischium or ischium is located posteriorly. The osteology of the hip can be challenging because there are so many landmarks. So I like to divide the bone into two major categories the medial or internal aspect and the lateral or external aspect. And I like to approach each of the bones in this way, meaning I always keep in mind whether I'm looking at the medial or lateral side. Now, a lot of textbooks describe the anatomy and osteology of the os coxae beginning with the ilium. But I like to begin with the acetabulum because it is made up of all three bones. Also, I will repeat certain landmarks several times during this presentation because I think it's helpful to look at the same structure from different perspectives. And hopefully this will help you as you study this material. And we'll be using a left specimen for this video. The acetabulum faces lateral and it articulates with the head of the femur forming the hip joint, which is a ball and socket joint. The ilium makes up the upper two-fifths of the acetabulum. The ischium makes up the posterior two-fifths, and the pubis makes up the remaining anterior one-fifth. The acetabular margin is a rim of bone around the acetabulum to which the acetabular labrum attaches. The acetabular labrum is a fibrocartilaginous structure. At the inferior aspect, you will notice a gap. This area is the acetabular notch. The transverse ligament of the hip also known as a transverse acetabular ligament, forms a bridge between the two ends of the acetabular notch, joining the two ends of the acetabular labrum. And this ligament is a fibrous continuation of the acetabular labrum. The ligament leaves a small gap between itself and the bone, and this forms the acetabular foramen. The capsule of the hip joint attaches to the acetabular labrum and the transverse acetabular ligament. The lunate surface is this crescent-shaped surface and is covered with hyaline cartilage. The head of the femur actually articulates here. The lunate surface is wider superiorly and is the weight-bearing surface. Essentially, the ilium is the entire weight-bearing surface of the acetabulum. The acetabular fossa is a non-articular surface within the acetabulum. This area is filled with a fat pad. The ligament teres binds the femoral head to the acetabulum, and this ligament serves to prevent the femoral head from dislocating. The acetabular fossa is continuous with the acetabular notch. The ilium is divided into two parts, the ala and the body. At the medial surface, the arcuate line separates the ala from the body. If you look at the lateral surface, the body is the upper two-fifths of the acetabulum. The upper border of the acetabulum separates the ala from the body. The body's lateral surface is also known as a femoral surface and is partly articular and partly non-articular. The articular portion forms part of the lunate surface and the non-articular portion forms part of the acetabular fossa. And remember, articular means it's covered with hyaline cartilage. The ala is a large expanded portion. It consists of two surfaces, an internal, also known as a pelvic surface, and an external surface, also known as a gluteal surface, a crest, and two borders, the anterior border, and the posterior border. The external surface has the posterior, anterior, and inferior gluteal lines and the supraacetabular groove, also known as the acetabular brim. The posterior gluteal line is the shortest and the most superior of the three. And behind this line, you'll notice an area that's divided into an upper rough and a lower smooth portion. This upper rough portion is where the gluteus maximus takes part of its origin. Between the posterior gluteal line 
and the anterior gluteal line, this area is concave and gives origin to the gluteus medius. And at the middle of this line, a lot of times you'll see a neutron foramen. And both the posterior gluteal line and the anterior gluteal line end near the upper portion of the greater sciatic notch. Between the anterior gluteal line and the inferior gluteal line, which ends near the middle of the greater sciatic notch, this area gives rise to the gluteus minimus. If you notice below the inferior gluteal line, you'll see multiple nutrient foramen. And this area, the supraacetabular groove, gives rise or origin to the reflected head of the rectus femoris muscle. And the straight head actually comes off the anterior inferior iliac spine. The internal surface of the ala contains a large, smooth, concave surface which is known as the iliac fossa, which gives origin to the iliacus muscle. Posterior to the iliac fossa is a rough surface, divided into two portions. Inferiorly, we have the auricular surface, which articulates with the sacrum, forming the sacroiliac joint. The auricular surface extends to the posterior, inferior iliac spine which is the upper portion of the greater sciatic notch. The superior portion is the iliac tuberosity, which serves as attachment of the short posterior sacroiliac ligament and the interosseous sacroiliac ligaments. Remember that the posterior sacroiliac ligament is divided into a short and long ligament. The short portion attaches to the iliac tuberosity and the long portion attaches to the posterior superior iliac spine. Below and parallel to the auricular surface is a pre-auricular sulcus, which is more prominent in females. The anterior sacroiliac ligament attaches here. The anterior border of the ala has two projections. This is the anterior superior iliac spine. The inguinal ligament, also known as pulpars ligament, attaches here, and the sartorius and tensor fascia lata originate from here. Below the notch is the anterior inferior iliac spine, which gives origin to the straight head of the rectus femoris and to the iliofemoral ligament. The iliofemoral ligament is the strongest capsular ligament. The posterior border of the ala also has two projections. This is the posterior superior iliac spine and the posterior inferior iliac spine. And below the posterior inferior iliac spine is a greater sciatic notch. The iliac crest extends from the anterior superior iliac spine to the posterior superior iliac spine. The highest point of the iliac crest is at the level of L4. The crest is divided into a ventral and dorsal component. The anterior two-thirds makes up the ventral component and the posterior one-third makes up the dorsal component. And the ventral component is divided into an inner, intermediate, and outer lip. The outer lip contains the iliac tubercle, which is the widest part of the iliac crest it is found about 5 cm behind the anterior superior iliac spine. It is located at the level of L5. The tensor fascia lata arises from the gluteal surface of the ala between the ASIS and the iliac tubercle, so this region right over here. The external oblique and latissimus dorsi muscles insert into the outer lip. The internal oblique muscles attach to the intermediate lip, and the transverse abdominis and quadratus lumborum attach to the inner lip. The dorsal segment is divided by a ridge into an inner and outer sloping surface. The outer sloping surface gives origin to the gluteus maximus, and the inner sloping surface serves as the attachment for the erector spinae muscles. The ischium is the strongest portion of the hip bone. It consists of a body and a ramus. 
The body's external surface forms part of the lunate surface, acetabular fossa, and acetabular notch. The upper part of the body forms the lower part of the greater sciatic notch. The spine of the ischium separates the greater sciatic notch from the lesser sciatic notch. The lesser sciatic notch lies between the ischial spine and the ischial tuberosity. The sacrospinous ligament attaches to the ischial spine. The jumellus superior originates from the ischial spine and the superior margin of the lesser sciatic notch, whereas the jumellus inferior originates from the inferior margin of the lesser sciatic notch and the ischial tuberosity. The posterior surface of the ischial tuberosity is divided by a ridge into two portions, an upper smooth quadrilateral portion and a lower rough triangular portion. The upper portion is further divided into two parts, a lateral and a medial. The semimembranosus originates from the lateral portion and the semitendinosus and the long head of the biceps femoris originates from the medial portion. The vertical fibers of the adductor magnus take origin from the rough area and the sacrotuberous ligament attaches here. The sacrotuberous ligament has several attachments, the ischial tuberosity, the posterior superior and posterior inferior iliac spines. If you look at a posterior view of the body, you see a spike, which is the ischial spine. The sacrospinous ligament attaches to the tip of the spine, and the levator ani and coccygeus muscles originate from the pelvic surface of the spine. Above the spine is a greater sciatic notch, and below is the lesser sciatic notch. The greater sciatic notch is converted into the greater sciatic foramen by the sacrospinous ligament, and it transmits the piriformis. Passing above the piriformis is the superior gluteal artery and nerve, and passing below is the inferior gluteal artery and nerve, the sciatic, pudendal, and posterior femorocutaneous nerves. The lesser sciatic notch is converted into the lesser sciatic foramen by the sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments, and it transmits the tendon of obturator internus. The ramus of the ischium courses medially and joins the inferior ramus of the pubis to enclose the obturator foramen. Some anatomists call this the ischiopubic ramus. I think it's easier to study this aspect of the hip bone as one piece as opposed to studying the rami of the ischium and pubis separately because there is overlap in terms of muscle origins. The ischial pubic ramus consists of two borders, a superior and inferior, and two surfaces, an external surface and the internal surface. The upper border serves as the lower margin of the obturator foramen, and the obturator membrane attaches here. The lower border is everted more so in males than females, and serves as the attachment for the crust of the corpus cavernosum in both men and women. The outer surface is concave, and serves as the origin for four muscles, the obturator externus, adductor brevis, gracilis, and adductor magnus. More specifically, the horizontal fibers of the adductor magnus originate from the inferior ramus of the pubis, and the oblique fibers of the adductor magnus originate from the ramus of the ischium. The inner surface serves as the attachment for the urogenital diaphragm, sphincter urethra, and the deep transverse perineal muscle. Also, the obturator internus takes origin from the inner surface. The pubis is the only point where the two os coxae meet at the anterior midline. Is composed of a body and two rami, the inferior ramus and the superior ramus. The superior ramus makes up the anterior two fifths of the acetabulum, contributing to part of the lunate surface, acetabular fossa, and the acetabular notch. The pectineal line starts at the iliopubic eminence, courses medial, and ends at the pubic tubercle. 
The pectineal surface is a triangular surface that is found between the pectineal line and the obturator crust, and the pectineus muscle originates from the superior aspect of this surface. And the pelvic surface of the superior ramus is found between the pectineal line and the inferior border of the superior ramus, and it is also a triangular surface. The body consists of the pubic tubercle, pubic crust, and the symphyseal surface, which articulates with the opposite os coxae to form the pubic symphysis. An injury to this articulation results in separation of the two os coxae, and this is known as an open book fracture. The inguinal ligament originates from the anterior superior iliac spine, or ASIS, and attaches to the pubic tubercle. If you follow the arcuate line inferior, you come to the iliopubic, or iliopectineal eminence. This is where the ilium and the pubis meet, and is located at the anterior middle aspect of the acetabulum. And if you follow the iliopubic eminence inferior, you come to the pectineal line. The lacunar ligament, also known as Gimbernaut's ligament, attaches to the pectineal line. If you follow the pectineal line inferior, you come to the pubic tubercle. And next to the pubic tubercle is the pubic crest. And next to the pubic crest is the symphyseal surface. The arcuate line, together with the pectineal line, forms the linea terminalis, also known as the pelvic brim. The linea terminalis separates the true pelvis from the false pelvis. The true pelvis is below the line, and the false pelvis is above the linea terminalis. If you start at the pubic tubercle, you will see two ridges that project into the superior ramus, the pectineal line, and the obturator crest. The obturator crest extends from the pubic tubercle to the anterior margin of the acetabular notch. Between the crest and the pectineal line is the iliopubic eminence. Below the obturator crest is the obturator groove, which allows passage for the obturator artery and nerve as it passes through the obturator canal. The obturator foramen is mostly covered by the obturator membrane, which serves as the attachment for the obturator externus and obturator internus muscles.